In this video, I will cover the basics of using ultrasound imaging of the spine to assist with thoracic epidural insertion. As always, a good understanding of spinal anatomy is essential to using ultrasound imaging. The morphology of the thoracic spine varies by level. The lower thoracic vertebrae are similar to the lumbar vertebrae in shape, whereas the mid and upper thoracic spine, particularly in the T4 to T9 area, have steeply angled spinous processes and laminae that overlap each other. This leads to very small imaging windows in the parasagittal oblique view and no acoustic window into the vertebral canal at all in the transverse view. There are significant differences in the shape of the typical thoracic and lumbar vertebrae. Note how the laminae are flatter in the thoracic vertebra and transition into a prominent transverse process. Unlike the articular processes of the lumbar vertebrae, the articular processes of the thoracic vertebrae do not protrude posteriorly and are not usually visible with ultrasound. These are the structures then that would be seen on the transverse ultrasound view. The spinous process, which marks the neuraxial midline, the lamina, the transverse process, which articulates with the rib, and the pleura. As always, bony surfaces are recognized as bright white echogenic lines with dark acoustic shadowing beneath. The anterior and posterior complexes of the vertebral canal are almost never visible as there is no interspinous acoustic window in the thoracic spine. What the transverse view is useful for is to map the midline, particularly in patients with scoliosis or, for example, the ICU patient with impalpable landmarks due to dependent edema who is also lying in a soft, saggy bed that leads to, to curvature of the spine. The parasagittal oblique view provides the most useful information. The laminae in the thoracic spine have a flat, plate-like appearance unlike the sloping sawtooth appearance of lumbar lamina. The gaps between these flat hyperechoic lines is the interlaminar space. Hyperechoic elements within this space are not necessarily the posterior complex. The laminae overlap, so this often represents the cranial edge or lip of the bony lamina and can obstruct needle passage if it is not advanced at an appropriately steep needle angle. Do not always expect to see the anterior and posterior complexes, except perhaps in young patients with flexible spines or in the lower thoracic spine. What information do we gain from these images? Firstly, we know and can mark the transverse plane in which the interlaminar space is located. Secondly, we can measure the depth to the lamina, giving us the minimum needle depth required to reach the epidural space. As we will see later, the actual needle depth will be greater than this. But for now, this represents a safe minimum needle insertion depth. Third, we can mark the position of the midline if this cannot be easily palpated. With these three pieces of information, we should be able to more easily triangulate our needle approach to enter the thoracic epidural space. In general, I recommend a needle insertion point approximately half a centimeter away from the midline to avoid an excessively large lateral to medial angle and one to two centimeters inferior to the plane of the interlaminar space, which will allow for a cranial angle of 50 to 60 degrees. Imaging is even more helpful if there is a scoliotic deformity as scanning on both left and right sides of the spine will allow selection of the side where the spaces are more open, or more specifically, where the interlaminar gap is more prominent on ultrasound. Note that degenerative disease of the spine with osteophyte formation can result in narrowing of some of the intervertebral spaces or even complete closure. This will not be evident without some sort of imaging and also speaks to the importance of trying alternative spaces if you're not as successful at the first chosen space. This is another example of osteophytes potentially obstructing passage into the epidural space. These recessed osteophytes may, however, not be clearly visible with ultrasound. 
One of the most important pearls for success is to keep the lateral to medial angle of the needle very small, no more than 5 to 10 degrees. To achieve this, the needle should be inserted just alongside the spinous process, not more than half a centimeter away in a paraspinous approach, which may look very much like a midline approach. Starting more lateral and using a larger lateral to medial angle increases the possibility that the needle may cross the midline and pass through the interspinous ligament into the contralateral vertebral muscle or even into the pleural space, both of which may produce a subjective loss of resistance. Note that this paraspinous approach is also often what happens when a so-called midline approach is used. The needle slips to one side of the supraspinous ligament and advances alongside the spinous process rather than truly in the midline through the interspinous ligament. The reason why it is important to insert the needle inferior to the transverse plane of the interlaminar space is because the overlapping nature of the thoracic lamina results in this bony lip of lamina that lies under the overhanging edge of the lamina above. This will impede a needle that is advanced at a caudal cranial angle that is too large. The angle of 55 degrees that is commonly advocated in regional anesthesia textbooks is the trajectory that is necessary to get past that bony lip into the epidural space. And that in turn is why the needle insertion point needs to be inferior or below the marked level of the interlaminar space. This trajectory also means that the actual needle depth required to reach the space will be greater than that measured depth to the lamina. The vertical depth of the lamina, 3 cm in this example, merely indicates the minimum depth that you need to insert the needle before even reaching the lamina. Knowing this safe minimum depth is helpful, particularly in a larger patient as you then no longer worry that your needle is going in 5 or 6 cm or more before you get any tactile sense of where you are. If you start your insertion two centimeters inferior to the level of the space and your trajectory is at a 55 degree angle, then now the distance to the lamina is 3.6 centimeters. And thereafter, to pass from the posterior surface of the lamina through the ligamentum flavum and into the space is usually at least another one centimeter. So the actual needle distance becomes closer to 5 cm than to 3 cm. This difference will increase with deeper spaces. In general, expect that the actual needle depth will be greater than the estimated depth by about 1.5 to 2 cm. Here is a video illustrating the needle insertion process after scanning and marking. The vertical line on the patient's back is the midline and the horizontal line is the location of the interlaminar space. The needle, as said before, is inserted half a centimeter lateral to the midline and about one and a half centimeters inferior to the interlaminar space. The needle is inserted more or less perpendicular to the skin to contact the lamina as a starting point. The needle is then gradually walked cranially up the lamina until it slips off the edge into the interlaminar space. Note as always that the lateral to medial angle is very small and does not change as the needle is walked up cranially in this paraspinous approach. So here the needle is contacting the lamina at the estimated depth of 3 cm. At this point the stylet is removed and the loss of resistance syringe is attached. The needle is then walked gradually off the edge of the lamina into the interlaminar space to engage the ligamentum flavum and to seek the traditional loss of resistance. Note that loss of resistance in this case is obtained about two and a half centimeters deeper than the initial contact with the lamina. Another thing that ultrasound is useful for is to accurately identify the thoracic intervertebral levels for epidural insertion.
There are three ways to do this. First, if you are already familiar with lumbar spine scanning, you can identify the L5-S1 interspace using the parasagittal oblique view and count upwards from there. Second, you can identify the lowermost rib, assume it is the 12th rib and count upwards from there. Third, and my preferred method for the upper thoracic spine, you can identify the first rib and count downwards from it. To identify the first rib, place the ultrasound probe in the supraclavicular fossa as though doing a supraclavicular brachial plexus block. The first rib is easily identifiable as an elongated hyperechoic structure with a subclavian artery and the brachial plexus lying on it. Slide the probe around the root of the neck and posteriorly staying medial to the scapula. This will bring the posterior part of each subsequent rib into view. The first rounded shadow that appears after the first rib is the second rib. It is not the posterior part of the first rib as you can appreciate from the graphic. From here on, it is just a question of counting from the second to the third to the fourth to the fifth rib and so on and so forth. When you have found the rib that corresponds to the interspace that you are interested in targeting, slide the probe medially to visualize the transverse process and then the lamina. It's important to note, however, that because of the cranial angle that the transverse process makes with the lamina, the lamina that is in line with the rib and tip of the transverse process is actually the upper one, the T4 lamina in this case, and the T5 lamina will be lower or more caudal. So in this case, following the fifth rib will lead you to the T4, T5 space. The T5, T6 space is the next lower one and not necessarily in view on the ultrasound image. This video illustrates this. The first rib is easily recognizable as before as a long shadow with artery and plexus resting on top. The second rib is the next shadow, and each rib can be counted in turn. Sliding neatly from the third rib in this case, we see the T3 transverse process transition to the T2 lamina, and the T2 to T3 interlamina space is visible. Thank you for watching. Check out the other videos in the Neuraxial Blockade playlist for more information, especially on ultrasound imaging of the spine and for lumbar neuraxial techniques.